welcome Broncos everybody. Country. <laughs> oh my bad, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in that. In I believe in that. Oh in. yeah. Welcome everybody back to another episode of the Ball Knower Podcast Team Previews. I'm joined today by the man himself, Elite Takes, also known as Nico. And of course, down at the bottom here, he doesn't have his camera on, but we're also joined by Strictly Sports Podcast, also known as Travis. And if it isn't apparent, we're going to be talking about the Miami Dolphins today. But first and foremost, guys, how are we doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Now, uh... Nico, before we get into this, I have a question for you. I, I have one question for you. Not related to the Dolphins, just in general. You've been doing a lot of top 10 lists recently on your TikTok account. That's been the majority of your content. And you went through yes, just about every position group, except for fullbacks. Why is that? Oh, no. <laughs> why why are you, you showing fullbacks slubs? Yeah, you keep ignoring it. You're disrespecting the greatest position in football. Hey, I I've got to put my list together. I got I got to do some research. Maybe I'll just copy yours and just honestly like, take it as my own. Do it. Take just spread your propaganda. I <laughs> I will make a top ten list and send it to you, and you can do whatever you want with it. By all means, if that, no, <laughs> if that's good. if that's how we get elite takes on the bring the fullback back uh, bandwagon trend, whatever you want to call it, then so be it. Even if it's not genuine, I'll take it. <laughs> but we'll do some Xander Horvath film, film breakdowns in the preseason. Xander, We're going to do that. Yes, that's beautiful. I love it. I love it. This, That's great. Okay. So – we're here to talk about the Dolphins, not fullbacks, unfortunately, although there is a fullback we'll get to in a little bit. I think the best place to start here is just to talk about the biggest move of the offseason, going out and getting Tyreek Hill. Just as a basic concept, what are your thoughts on that? How do you feel about that? Well, I think that with the with the Tyreek Hill move, it's really just the Dolphins going out and saying, we didn't really love anyone in the draft this year in terms of what we needed. I mean, like, Tyler Linderbaum obviously would have been great, but obviously they knew he wasn't going to fall to the Niners pick at 30. That Niners pick just really got progressively worse throughout the season. So I think with the Tyree Kill trade, it's just like we had a lot of cap space. Um, he obviously is going to, you know, fit well in the system of just get getting elite, elite playmakers. And I think with Tyree Kill... He's just a guy that makes a quarterback's job easier. And for Tua, that's that's exactly what you want. A guy who's not going to, you know, require all of these intricate over-the-middle throws. Just a guy that you get him the ball or he's open enough where you can just deliver the ball um, with plenty of room for air. Fair. Uh, Travis? Uh, I think I, I agree. I mean, you could just give him – any like the ball at any moment he could just take it and yeah run. yeah and especially obviously pairing him with your boy Jalen Waddle giving you one of the most dangerous receiver duos in all of football I, I'm very very excited to see what um it, oh my god Mike McDaniel is going to scheme up with those two because the possibilities are endless. Legitimately, the possibilities are endless because both guys oh, yeah. Yeah. are incredible after the catch and very much fit that get them the ball short, let them do their thing, and that helps to us so much, obviously, with uh, a lot of a lot of question marks surrounding what he's going to do this season, which let's let's jump to that. How do we feel about Tua? I feel like Tua is in a spot where they're really just trying to maximize what they can get out of him and and then probably move on next season. I mean, you could say it's a sort of evaluation year for Mike McDaniel, but he's really the only new guy in charge. I, I think with Tua, it's like we need to try and recreate what made him successful at Bama. And at Alabama, he had Jalen Waddell, he had Henry Ruggs, so you're already kind of re replicating – that type of speed and just separation downfield. I, I really think that's what the goal here is to give to a one season in a system similar to what made the Dolphins front office fall in love with him in the first place. 
and you know just see can he really elevate this offense or is he more of just a fair weather quarterback um but i think tua is you know he's accurate he doesn't um he doesn't have like super crazy athletic limitations in terms of just being a statue in the pocket but you know obviously the decision making um has to improve the arm talent is noticeably <laughs> one of one of the worst in the league but i i think with tua it's just can you get him back to his alabama self and his alabama self will be more than fine in terms of what we're looking for with the talent we have around him yeah Absolutely. Travis, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, kind of said it all. Like, <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I agree with it. Okay, fair enough. So with Coach McDaniel, obviously, listen, first of all, is it McDaniel or McDaniels? I can never get it right. It's McDaniel. I, I was calling him McDaniels I do the first, Yeah, so. I do the same thing. I can never get it right, and I – what, I'm screwing him up with what, Josh McDaniels? I don't know. Either way, the new coach, <laughs> that fella that fella Mike, uh, obviously he's a, a bit of a character, a bit of a... Definitely. <laughs> uh, I'm obviously a big fan of him coming from the Shanahan tree, and you know my feelings about the Shanahan tree. I'm absolutely obsessed with it. So Tua playing with him, I think, is a fantastic fit. Because like you said, whether they want to go back to that sort of what he was doing at Alabama, or they want to go towards more of what San Fran has been doing with Jimmy Garoppolo, who's a very similar quarterback, not the most talented, but he's not bad or anything like that. Like you can win games with him sort of like, I mean, a game manager, we'll, we'll just call it what it is. Um, I, I definitely think McDaniel was the perfect hire for Tua. And then obviously adding Tyreek to that offense and like, overhauling the running back room which they've got something going on there i don't i don't know what their plan it, is it's, it's an interesting operation <laughs> it, it really is it's like the uh the the tiktok sound where it was like what are they building in there that's what i what think that's what i think when i see my like the running twitter back meme room. that's like what was he cooking yeah there you go that's even better that's basically what's going on there but literally because you've got what you've got sony michelle you've got raheem mostert you've got um Chase Edmonds, and then Gaskin's still there, right? Yes. Yep, unfortunately, he is still there. <laughs> is Gaskin that bad? He he has... He, he really is not that good. He doesn't have breakaway speed. He has zero power. Like, if you make any sort of contact with that guy at the line of scrimmage, he's just flopping straight to the ground. Like, he, he is not a three-down back. He is... At the very best, like this third down scat back that we've been giving like 20 touches a game for the past three seasons. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, so I, I can't even fathom what their plan is at running back. I mean, I guess you, you've got the, the concept of running back by committee, but you've got a committee of like six guys. <laughs> oh, man. They're going to have to cut some of them. Like, well, there, there's no yeah. way you can keep all four of those. All six of them, really. Like, there are six guys that I think realistically have a chance to be part of that four-man committee. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, you've got another guy in the backfield with Alec Ingold. So you have, like, seven total backs on the roster. And Alec oh, Ingold, yeah. I mean, we've seen him. Obviously, you've seen me or praise him like crazy. He's a fantastic runner. He really is. If you get the ball in his hands, he's going to work. And I think he might be one of the closest things to Kyle Juszczyk that you're going to find in the NFL right yeah. now. So him going to Miami is another perfect fit. I mean, McDaniel absolutely hit it out of the park because I know that would have been his guy. That would have been someone he was pushing to get oh, signed. Yeah. Uh, he's going to fit in that scheme so well. He's going to be such a big part of that offense. He's going to be a great security blanket for Tua, a lead blocker for whichever of the six running backs is running the ball on any given play. He can stay in as a pass blocker. He, and he can run the, like I just said, he can run the ball. He can do a little bit of everything. And he's going to be, uh, I think he's probably like the sneaky signing that that Miami made this offseason that's going to play a big impact on their offense. And granted, I'm also saying that because he's a fullback, but, you know, he's he's still that I'm, guy. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really like the Miami 49ers. Yeah. Like everything the 49ers have on offense, 
you know, McDaniel came in, you know, I guess you could say waddles the Ayuk of the offense. You go in and get Tyreek Hill, who's more so of like the Debo guy. You get your use check and Alec Ingold. You hired the 49ers tight end coach to try and make Mike Kosicki a semi-effective blocker. Um, but it, I, I would say that his receiving a talent is not too far off from that of Kittle. Yeah. So it, it's really a very similar offense personnel-wise in mm-hmm. terms of how the skill sets align with what he was working with in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but he literally brought over Raheem Mostert as well, just just to oh, yeah. to further progress it. Like he, it, that's kind of what I was getting at is that they're literally the Miami 49ers. It's incredible. Yeah, again, I also, love that. They also brought in 49ers preseason legend Trent Sherfield. You're right. And wide receiver coach Wes Welker. So it's like, Wes my Welker? gosh, <laughs> yeah, Wes Welker is the receiver coach. That is the second position coach I learned about today. Fun fact. I was recording the Texans episode and I found out that Josh McDaniel's little brother is the pass game coordinator in Houston. And Oh, I, I had no idea. I didn't about know that. that either. And I didn't know Wes Welker was a damn receivers coach. That's great. It's fantastic. He's Even teach better. All of them how to, you know, play the game the right way. With high intensity, fundamentals, high intensity, grit, high motor. high motor, yes. It's going to be perfect. This is going to be the best Miami receiver core we've ever seen just because of Wes Welker being the mentor. I mean, really, like Miami, their best receiver, I would say, in my lifetime was Jarvis Landry at his peak in like 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. Now you got two guys that I think could realistically like over, um, like exceed his peak, like at the same time. So this is the best Miami Dolphins wide receiver core in years. And yeah. I, I don't know a ton about Wes Welker, admittedly, what he did in San Francisco, but I, I assume he just has them doing a lot of, you know, running back style drills. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, he's learned from the best. He's putting that Belichick oh, yeah. mentality into him. Um, So the only position group, well, we didn't talk about Cedric Wilson either, which I thought was a pretty big signing oh, yeah. for Miami. Um, So if you want to talk about him. Yeah, I think, um, you know, he's basically replacing... So last year we had Waddle in the slot. He he really was in the slot more than a lot of people talk about. Um, but I, I think we all know that he was always drafted to be this outside, you know, vertical sideline guy. That, that was just more of like a, you know, temporary fix because we didn't really have... Um, that prototypical route runner yak guy over the middle for Tua. Um, you got like Preston Williams, who's this physical injury prone guy. He's made of glass. You got Devontae Parker, and now he's out of there. So really now, you can put everyone where they're supposed to be. Cedric Wilson was pretty much always the slot guy for the Cowboys. I mean, last year he was the wide receiver four, but um, he, he stepped in there a good amount. Last year was his best season yet. I believe he had like um 500 yards or so he caught a really long touchdown in the vikings game if you happen to remember that i think Um, i do he's just he's a stud aside from the playoff game in the whole you know fourth down disaster where he dropped the pass he's been really reliable for them like every time you watch the cowboys play he he's just making the the simple plays making the catches getting separation like I, I think he's a very serviceable wide receiver three. Absolutely. Um, and that, another receiver, I forget how to say the dude's name. It's the rookie, Eric. Eric Izukama, I believe. How do you feel about him? Because I haven't heard anything about him. I didn't watch him before mm. the draft. I know very little. I'm going to be honest. When that pick came through, I was like, who the heck is that? Because I don't even think he was – Close to my best receiver available. I think Shakir was available. Um, I think Bo Melton was still up there. I I think those were the two guys, but I I thought we were drafting a running back, so it really caught me out of the blue. Um, I was not super happy at first because I'm like, we we just got out and got all these receivers, and now you're going to spend our second biggest pick in the entire draft on, you know, another wide receiver. But Isokama... I actually do remember watching him a bit at Texas Tech. Spoiler alert, he's another Yak guy. In in case you couldn't uh, make that 
assumption. He he's another one of those um, gadget guys. Not super fast, but boy, does he break a lot of tackles if you watch his tape. Maybe he's your D-Bell. Maybe that's the plan with him. E- every receiver in the NFL that can break tackles <laughs> is the next D-Bell. It's the truth. Yeah, that's, that's how it is. These it's days. just how that's it how works. The dialogue has to yeah. Work. Yep. And I mean, it, it is what it is, you know? But every yeah. receiver can, you know, have 900 <laughs> yards after the catch in a yeah. season. It's simple. That's light work. Cooper Cup could do that with his eyes closed. It's no big oh, yeah, deal at Cooper all. Cup. Now, uh, moving on, I, I do want to ask about one other player uh, before we get on to the offensive line, which is like the next big position group. Me and you had a little bit of a back and forth on Twitter a couple weeks ago about a certain former Chicago Bears tight end that's on this roster. Oh, Shaheen the Machine. And, everyone's favorite. Yeah, it's everyone's least favorite over here. Is is he really? like legitimately a fan favorite in Miami? Do y'all really love him? I I mean it's kind of one of those things where it, it's just a meme when he makes yeah. a big play. Like he's not out on the field much, I guess, getting right. targets. But he did have a few like touchdowns over the few years, and he pulled out some celebrations. And you know how everyone, anyone right. who pulls out some celebrations can become a fan favorite. So mm-hmm. that's where Shaheen the Machine came from. Yeah, well, when he was in Chicago, he was Baby Gronk and was supposed to be our franchise tight end. And then he just said, nah, I'm good. But now we. Is he a second round pick? Yes, out of Ashland University. The same (laughs) year. He was a Patriot style pick, basically. Yeah. Except you're not giving him to Belichick. Right. Right. We we gave him to Matt Nagy, who was notoriously horrible when it comes to developing tight ends. Um, And. If That's I'm made in heaven, if I'm not mistaken, no, it definitely was. It was the Trubisky draft on top of that 2017, just to throw a little salt in the wound. We drafted Trubisky, then drafted Shaheen the next round. What a what a combo! What a connection that is. <laughs> they were supposed to be the the next big duo. It was duo. supposed to be the next Brady to Gronk. It was that that was the thought process, and then it just didn't <laughs> happen. But we did have Zach Miller. Wait a minute. I think she Zach Miller was Zach Miller was good, but I think she might have actually been 2018. I need to fact check that. When did Jimmy Graham come in? Was Jimmy that Graham, he was. <laughs> no, it was 2017. Okay, he's the highest pick ever from his college, by the way. Just putting that out there from Ashland University. Seems like a very prestigious football program, <laughs> right. considering the outcome of their best player ever. Yeah, I think Jimmy Graham would have been 2020. So he was with Chicago for two years, and all he did was steal Cole Komet's targets down the field and then become the only player we schemed up plays for in the red zone. It was oh abysmal. God. That that Komet Jimmy Graham end zone obsession of Matt Nagy, I, I just I can't get over it. It's it wasn't so funny. even Komet. It was just Graham. Graham would split up. Listen, everyone knew it was coming every single time. You split Graham out wide, you're throwing a back shoulder fade to him in the corner of the end zone. Everyone knew it was coming every time, and it worked sometimes, because Graham's just massive and you can't it stop worked. him. But, like, that also required Trubisky to throw an accurate pass, and Lord knows he can't do that consistently, so. <laughs> that, that offense... Yeah. All right, we I, I can't I can't get into my feels right now. We we got stuff to talk about. So Miami's offensive line, obviously, one of the bigger free agent signings out of any team. He went out and got Tron Armstead, um, and then Connor Williams was also an addition this offseason, right? Yep. Okay. So as a whole, how do you feel about this offensive line? I, I still am not sold. I think. Um, you know, Armstead obviously at his best is probably a top five tackle in the NFL. Maybe even like behind, just behind Bakhtiari on the left side. But he he has some had some really big injury issues over the past few years. I mean, I think he only played eight games last year, and he was good as usual. Um, but I, I I can't really complain too much about that signing. Like that, you bring in the best offensive lineman on the market like what what can i really complain about there connor williams is a guy that no cowboys fans really seem to hate like i remember 
I was doing my research. I was like, this guy doesn't give up that many pressures. He just has a penalty issue. And I was like, I kind of like the signing. And then all these Cowboys fans were in my replies saying, have fun with him. And I was like, oh, that's not great to hear. Um, but, you know, Williams, um, they're trying to decide if they're putting him at center or left guard. I would prefer to keep him at guard um, just because I think that he could replace some of our other not so great guards on the team whereas we have a somewhat serviceable center um so i i'm hoping that we have the left side solid robert hunt is you know the only guy who i even semi appreciated last year play of the year by the way um in the ravens game (laughs) we should we should be using him like alec ingold to be honest like he was our alec ingold last year um he's fine like i like him um, but man, Eichenberg, um, Liam Eichenberg and Austin Jackson, Jesse Davis too, just three guys on that offensive line that were like, would be on any other team that they, they would not start. They would not like Eichenberg right. had the most pressures allowed in the league. It, it was, it was really bad. Luckily we got rid of Jesse Davis. Getting rid of him was maybe the best thing we did to our offensive line this off season, <laughs> but the, the right side really does kind of scare me because I think it's a front office that has a bit of an ego and doesn't want to accept that they're not hitting on their picks. They can't evaluate offensive linemen out of college properly. I can't give up on Eichenberg yet, but I'm out on Jackson. He He's a he's a total bust. Right. He gets put on his butt like five times a game when he plays. Yeah. So, like, I think the offensive line – Maybe not the worst in the league per se, um, but like it was last year. It probably was the worst in the league last year, but I'd, I'd probably put it around 25. Not not an absolute disaster, but still probably the biggest liability on our team. I can agree with that. I can get behind that. Um, yeah, I, I can't disagree with anything you said about the line. You obviously know more than I do. I'm not an offensive line expert. I don't know what the heck was going on with Miami's line, so I don't really have much to add. But before we get into talking about the defense, uh, I tweeted out before we started recording a couple hours ago asking for questions. And because it's you coming on, we actually got responses this time. So I've got a couple questions we're going to run through, and uh, I'll just leave them up to you to answer. And if I feel the need, I'll give my input. So starting out... We've got my guy Jarrett, who was on the Bears episode, and we kind of already covered this, but maybe you want to double down on it. He said, do you think there's any chance that Tua can be a top five quarterback at some point in his career, or do you think he's going to be an average, bad, Super Bowl caliber starter? I don't know what a Super Bowl caliber starter is. Maybe he meant game manager? Like the Jimmy G's of the world? Okay, yeah. I think that that with Tua, it's like – Unless he becomes Drew Brees in terms of processing the field and just not missing any pass within 20 yards of the line of scrimmage by a hair, sure, maybe he can be top five one day. But I think the realistic ceiling is like Mac Jones. Like that, that is really the ceiling I'm getting from him right now. If he can't like develop his, the force he can put into his throws, I know that. Um, his arm strength has definitely been hindered by that hip injury that he hasn't really recovered from to this day. Um, every year it seems to get a little bit better, though. The arm strength was, I would say, a little bit better last year. But I, I think to a ceiling is like the Jimmy G, the Mac, the rookie Mac Joneses of the world. They can manage games. They can get the ball out quick. They can be accurate. But, you know, don't don't expect them to change the game with one throw. So... Do you think if he continues to play at that level that Miami's just going to run it out or let him run his course with his contract, or do you think they'll try to move on before that? Um, Well, I think if there's a year to move on from him, it's really next year when you have two first-round picks. Um, Don't have, like, I don't think we're going to have a ton of cap space um, next year, so you definitely – I, I don't know how much cap space would play into the rookie contract, but that that's definitely something to consider. I, I think the next off season would would really be the year to move on because you got you got guys who are kind of aging, like Xavier Howard and Tyreek Hill are about to turn the thirty years old corner. I, I think that you have to make a decision after this season. I, I really think that 
Um, this is either where you extend him, which we know would be a cloud nine scenario. Um, if if you told me a year from now, like if seventeen year old Nico went up to me and said, "Right now, Tua just got a five year extension." Like I would have to assume we won the Super Bowl this year, so <laughs> I, I think that I think that this um, after year three is the is the ultimatum for him. Fair enough. Um, we've got Aleem got wheels who was on the Lions episode. He asks, "Do you think Mike McDaniel's is legit?" I I think with McDaniel. Um, there's a lot to be excited about. I think he can come in and immediately, like, in terms of play designs, he, he knows what he's doing. He's mm-hmm. obviously coming from Kyle Shanahan, who's probably the best, um, you know, play designer in the league. So my only concern with McDaniel is I feel like he's a little too um, too friendly, like just a little too laid back um and you wonder if he can really earn the respect and keep the team locked in throughout the year like can he be that guy that really um you know gives them the tough talks during games or is he going to be the guy that just sugarcoats everything and makes it like um you know a play day every day at practice so that's my only real worry from him if he really has like the head coach, leader of men personality, but in in terms of what the influence he had on the moves we made this off season, I, I am very optimistic about him. I think that we're gonna pull out a lot of really intricate, effective stuff um, to get guys open to have a more successful run game. So I, I definitely like the hire. I just you know you see that potential disaster scenario where he's super inexperienced. No one on the team really like respects him a ton, so I think I think that he I lean towards him being the guy, but I'm not gonna you know act like he was the perfect candidate to go right. out and hire. Right. I mean, personally, I'm incredibly biased towards anyone coming out of that Shanahan tree. I just and it's not just because of the fullback thing. I just legitimately think anyone that's yeah, like, coming out of Shanahan's coaching system is some sort of genius. To a certain extent, it's they really, have an extremely high football IQ because to work with that man and understand all the concepts he's running and everything he's doing, you got to know ball. You have to, plain and simple. You got to know how this know game ball. works. You have to be a certified ball knower. <laughs> exactly. You have to. And anyone coming out of that tree or anyone that's influenced by it, 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 I have nothing but faith in them until I'm shown otherwise. And I do agree. I think McDaniel might be a little bit goofy. Uh, for a head coach yeah he's got like the um who's a coach that was kind of like that a few years back and failed um it's probably like six different coaches like... <laughs> um <laughs> I, I i don't i don't know who you're talking he's about he's kind of got like the um the bron the broncos head coach he's got the nathaniel hackett gene uh, somewhere no, he's he's, he's not as bad back. as hackett he is not as bad as hackett i would <laughs> he's, he's yeah I saw something, though, that I gained a lot of respect for him in terms of uh, being a leader. It was early on uh, in in OTAs, I believe, and it was like some ridiculous heat because, you know, Miami. And he was wearing like three sweatshirts or something to try and match like how hot the players would be. I thought that was cool. I thought that was a good like leadership moment. I mean, yeah, he's he definitely shows a legitimate care and passion um for his guys but you mm-hmm. know you, you want to keep a, a disciplined environment yeah hold no players i agree accountable i agree to an extent i mean who knows i we don't know what he's like behind the scenes maybe he is a complete hard ass behind the scenes this is all just a ploy i, I could see that i, I, could, I could too that. i could too it it would make too much sense for him to be that friendly and goofy out like the public eye and then just behind the scenes to rip you a new one every single time you do anything wrong I could maybe see he has that Brian Flores gene where um, the card that he's gonna pull out is never um, he do, he always pulls the unexpected card out of his mm. deck and it's like yeah there's there's a level of secrecy there you never know yeah I was gonna say he feels like a wild card that that's a perfect is, way to put he him. really is like the like kind of like Sean McVay when he first yeah, got hired as I a can head see coach, that you know. He's, He's this passionate, 
young offensive mind who just really brings a positive spirit to the mm-hmm. locker room. So, so we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. But, but I am definitely optimistic. I'm, I'm just frankly glad we didn't go with Kellen Moore or Vance <laughs> Joseph. Those were, oh, those man. were the two Vance guys Joseph, that made it to the He was in the end. conversations for your head coach job? Oh, yes, he was. Oh, he my was. Lord. Oh, man. Yeah. If we, if we had brought him back <laughs> – Wait, back? He was with Miami before? All I think of when it comes to Vance Joseph is that Monday night football incident, the reporter. Have you seen that video? Uh, Maybe. I I don't remember off the top of my head. You'd have to explain it to me. It's like the Vance Joseph having the time of his life. (laughs) I have seen that. Okay, I do know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, Yeah, I'm just very glad that we we chose the guy who I was endorsing. I I really was endorsing him over the over the field in terms of our search. Yeah, I think for the most part, um, most of the coaching hires this offseason were well done. I I didn't have a problem with many of them. Like, I don't love Hackett, and I'm not the biggest believer in McDaniel in uh, Vegas, the other McDaniel, just because we've seen him coach before, and it was was kind of a crapshoot. But he, I don't know, it's it's tough because he's kind of, uh, yeah. He's like a my my friend always talks about how um, he always has this fist bump with Bill Belichick every time they get a field goal, and it's like he's the most conservative coach mm-hmm. he's ever seen. Yeah, so I feel like he would have been. It was more... it was definitely McDaniel a top mm-hmm. a top five coaching hire, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like speaking of conservative, he would have been such a better coach for Kirk Cousins. They would have worked together so perfectly. Oh, yeah. That would have been a literal match made in heaven to go nine and eight or seven and ten, nowhere in between. It's it's one or the other. Put up, you know, twenty points a game on average. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just lose by three every single game. <laughs> Poor Justin Jefferson. I really hope they get him a quarterback sometime soon. They're going to. They're they're going to. I mean, they keep giving Kirk these little like um Mickey Mouse one year extensions. <laughs> At a certain point, <laughs> yeah, you got to do gonna something. He's going to be out. Yeah, I mean, going to be out. I don't know if you've seen me talk about Kirk Cousins before, but I hate that. Oh, man. he's I, like I've my, heard you're not the biggest. He's fan. probably. I think he's the definition of mid. I think that's the perfect way to describe Kirk. He doesn't do anything where I'm like, okay, I, I like it. You know, he doesn't. He's just the type of guy when you need five yards, he's always going to get you three. He's scared to throw it down the field. He doesn't want to take risks. He's just, I I just don't trust him to ever be a winning quarterback. And for him to have what I think is the best deep threat in football right now with Justin Jefferson, just to, just to be like, yeah, if he's not wide open with nobody within 10 yards of him, I'm not taking the shot. It's, it's insane to me. It's absolutely insane. (laughs) He's like what Derek Carr was a few years ago. Like I, I used to not be the biggest Derek Carr guy, but he he has legitimately developed that mm-hmm. aggressive. Derek Carr's um, got that dog in him, straight up. He's got that dog in him. He really Kirk does. Cousins has zero dog in him. Exactly zero. Yeah. See, we need to do this more. You get me. You understand me when it comes Just to football. Give the, uh, from now on, every single player we talk about, we have to give the got that dog in him scale grade. Okay. Okay. Just just to practice real quick, where would you put Tua on a scale of 1 to 10 of having that dog in him? Well, I mean, he did truck Michael Carter. <laughs> Tua trucked the guy over. Um, <laughs> I forgot about that completely. <laughs> and he, you know, he's a little bit of a coward, but he does have that dog in him. Like, he gets fired up. Yeah. He, he's like a... Like a four out of ten on the got that dog. I can scale. respect that. I can respect that. And Alec Ingold, obviously perfect ten. There's oh, no yeah, need to 10. explain. Okay. Um, next question we've got from Hunter, also known as Steel City Reppin, who was on the Steelers episode. I'm noticing a pattern here. Every question's been from somebody that's been on one of these podcast episodes. He said, Tyree Kill over or under 1300 yard season. I'm going to have to go with the under. Uh, I don't think the, the depth of target is really going to be there for him to, you know, put up those Mahomes-esque 200-yard games every once in a while. I think this year we're we're going to see a more consistent Tyreek Hill. Like, usually with him, it's either 20 yards or um, 200 yards. I think this year it's going to be, like, 90 to, like, 120 a game. So 
I, I'd say the slight under. Also because he's entering a wide receiver room with way more competition for mm-hmm. targets. Yeah, uh, when you did that hot takes video, the guy that said that he thinks Waddle won oh, yeah. and wide receiver won, I don't hate that take. I, I really don't. I, I think that Waddle's skill set aligns a little bit more with um, the guys that Tua has had mm-hmm. success targeting, like the guy that um, you know is going to be a really, really nuanced route runner over the middle of the field, a guy that you can kind of anticipate is going to be open. It's not really see it throw it with Jalen Waddle. You know that the second he turns that corner, it's going to be an automatic two-yard cushion. Mm-hmm. Like that That's really the beauty of him and how he used him in, in the slot last year. Waddle's such a good football player. He's gonna be. He's he, gonna be such a superstar long term. Okay, Jalen Waddle is is my king forever. <laughs> yeah, just like Cole Komet is mine. Now that's somebody that's got that dog in him. Not even the best tight end in the NFL that played for the Matt Nagy laid Bears. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Oh, is Shaheen this is okay. Shaheen this is a Shaheen narrative. Yeah, just gonna throw Zach Miller to the side like that. I see how it is. I'm going to act like the man who caught Mitchell Trubisky's first touchdown pass doesn't exist. See how it is. Shaheen better. Okay, well, Shaheen's a 2 on the 1 to 10, got that dog in him scale. I can oh, confidently boy. say that. Um, he, he's a little goofy. I get it. He is I get goofy. It. <laughs> he's a, a goofy-looking <laughs> dude. Have you ever seen him without his helmet off? Or with his helmet off? Not, not oh really, to God. be frank. He's a goofy-looking dude. He looks like... okay. Like I said, when he was coming out of college, his nickname was Baby Gronk. And I legitimately think he looks like a failed attempt at cloning Gronk in the face. <laughs> they Would failed. The, the science lab was just a little off that he was built in. Mm-hmm. Belichick's science lab screwed that one up and just let him loose in wherever Ashland is located. <laughs> and Matt Nagy was like, that'll do. I'll that'll take it. Do. I'm sold. I'll take it. I'm sold. Pairs perfectly with my franchise quarterback, Mitchell Trubisky. <sighs> All right. Uh, speaking of Chicago, we've got Chicago Stat Muse. He asks, oh, God, this is a long one and a mean one. Why are the Dolphins considered, quote, unquote, scary? You have two really good wide receivers, but you don't have a QB who can win you games, not to mention you have no source of a running game behind that line, and the defensive secondary is still horrid besides Howard. What did he say about the secondary? <laughs> it's horrid outside of Xavier and Howard. That's the best unit on our team. What? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and the first reply is no no way you said the secondary is horrid. So at least you got people backing you up with that. Someone used some balls. Someone injected some ball-knowing juice into him with that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, he didn't even name the best player in your secondary, in my opinion. Oh, I'm <laughs> we're going to have to get to that one. I'm a big Holland guy. I'm a big Holland guy. So, Who so isn't? True. So why are the Dolphins considered scary? If, if all that's true, what makes the Dolphins so scary? I mean, I, I think it's really just with the NFL. <laughs> I mean, if I'm answering this on a serious <laughs> note, w- when it comes to the NFL, you want to really have like, an established specialty and and I think on offense like just having a track team is really what makes them scary like most teams they just have a bunch of solid guys but the Dolphins have really gone all in to make one aspect of their offense something that defensive coordinators just don't see every week so I I, I think that's really what in all seriousness could make the Dolphins scary and and, and it's not just Waddle and Tyreek it, it's Mostert um it's it's all of those guys yeah also, they you got have, the three fastest guys in the NFL. Like, yeah, the correct answer was Alec Ingold. By the way, that's what makes them so scary. That is what makes them so scary. Yeah, he's um, got that dog. He we does. just have infinite dog in him in the backfield. Exactly, he has enough dog to go around. That, that's the beauty of Alec Ingold. He, he, he can, can spread, spread the it. love. Exactly. Um, let's see here. Oh, this is a great question from uh never heard of this guy before his name's elite takes he said is oh. robert hunt a good fantasy yeah. option this year he, he's an rv1 like every all the talk this year is about jonathan taylor and how you need to take the risk on christian mccaffrey for a third straight year have any of them 
cartwheeled into the end zone on a Thursday night game? Have any of them converted a play that was not even close to intended for them? Have any of them executed outside of structure like that? I don't think so. Executed outside of structure. <laughs> you need to draft fantasy based on who has that dog in him. Robert Hunt has like 99 overall dog in him. That, that's True. why he's True. the best fantasy option around. Dude, I don't play fantasy football, but now I am inspired to go play and only draft fullbacks. Oh. I, I think fantasy football, as long as you don't get too, like, um, invested in it, it, it's a fun aspect of football season. I, I would recommend. Just just don't just don't get too locked into it. Yeah, I mean, I've I've played a little bit. I'm not, like, I've never been a diehard player or, or anything. I think I've been in, like, three leagues total. Um, but, like, I, I just don't like the stigma that surrounds it, and I really can't stand the people that think it reflects real football. And get all their oh, takes yeah. from fantasy football. There's a certain it's someone like, out there that I've had a couple run-ins with that uh, fits that description what? very well, but I'm not going to drop his name on the podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's as long as as long as you just you know check it once a week. Don't get too right. invested. Right, set your lineup and leave it. Set your lineup and leave it. That that's a great mentality. Mm-hmm. That's a great mentality. Okay, we've got one from this will be the last one from Luan's Burner, which is Taylor it's Taylor Luan fan Taylor account. Luan. Why is there's it... a That is so random. <laughs> Taylor Luan. You know, Taylor Luan is just my favorite player in the NFL. But right. Let's see what he has to say. Let's see said, what he has to okay. say. How much of a step back do you think Tyreek takes with Tua at quarterback, or do you see Tua taking a big step up? I think it it's not really a step down for Tyreek. It's it's sort of a change of rule. I, I don't know if you seen um there's like this Twitter compilation of Tyreek Hill and all of his snaps at running back and, and, and it's it's just it's just amazing to watch. Like I think with Tyreek Hill, we're seeing like the Alex Smith era Tyreek Hill rather oh than the God. Mahomes era Tyreek Hill, right. which is like so you you just got like like um juiced up like 2016 Tyreek Hill here and I, and I think that definitely translates to to uh taking a step up at least on the stat sheet for sure yeah I I can get behind that I agree absolutely um what is this hold on we Uh-oh. I think we just got a, a comment oh no it, it was something completely different someone just replied who is that to something that I had tagged you in and I was like I thought they were I thought they were asking who you were but it was with um with that Texans corner that is incredibly underrated that we're not going to name because okay. the people need to learn Beard for themselves. Thomas. The people need to learn themselves. You can't drop his name. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So moving on, we got to talk about this defense. And I guess we should start with the secondary since they're so horrid. Oh, yeah. Worst unit on our team. So, I mean, just go ahead. Have at it. Talk about the secondary. I mean, I, I think the secondary – it, it was really not that great through the first half of the season. Like, I remember Antonio Brown um, gave Xavier Howard, like, <laughs> the worst time of his career. Um, that, that was, like, the all-time low for the secondary. Um, Byron Jones is just kind of quiet. Like, ever since we brought him in, he just you don't hear much from him, which I, I guess is a good thing for a corner. Like, at a certain point, you'd rather have him than a guy like... Um, Eli Apple, who's in the news every week, whether he does something good or bad. Um, so I, I think you've definitely got, like, a top five cornerback duo there. Um, and then you've got Nick Needham in the slot, who, honestly, it's, it's like, he, he's a stud. Like, he's a guy who ma- made some big plays for us down the stretch. He had that pick six in the Saints game. Everyone's the most clean game of football I've ever watched, by the way. Dolphins versus Saints, Monday Night Football. Sure, surely both quarterbacks put on a show. Surely, um, but of course. I, I think the safeties, um, it's really like, in terms of pass rushing, it, it's a really phenomenal duo. Like Brandon Jones, he really just is like a Jamal Adams where you really just want him to be rushing the passer um, most of the time. But Javon Holland, like, 
That that that's our guy, Javon Holland. He's that dude. He's a future All Pro. Like what? What can you say? Like absolutely. He, all over the place. All over the place. Like when it comes to defense, sometimes I get my eyes too stuck on like what the offense is doing while the Dolphins are on defense, but without even like paying attention to the defense, you notice the impact that he was making. Like all over the place. That's all mm-hmm. I can describe. Yeah. yeah. And I think we can both agree in already saying he's one of the best safeties in football. Like top oh, yeah. five to ten guy easily. He's incredible. And like you I said, remember. he's just everywhere. He's everywhere. He he's like a he's like young Derwin James where you can young he, he covers, he rushes the passer and, and he makes an impact in the run game. And it's like I remember if things got a little um, toxic on Twitter one day because um, I don't know how, but the the Minka like the Minka to Javon Holland transition started this Twitter war between Dolphins fans and Steelers fans, and someone said like Holland is already um, on Minka's level, but I, I don't think that's super ridiculous. To I was say. just getting ready to say I don't think it's ridiculous to say that at all. Just, just don't show this episode to those Steelers fans, man. Listen, Steelers fans are the worst fans in football. They they deserve uh, the hate the Cowboys fans get. And like without a doubt, they deserve that hate. They are Cowboys awful. fans overhated. Mm-hmm. That that has been one of my biggest agendas this offseason. <laughs> that the Cowboys need more sanity in terms of the dialogue about them. Yeah. It's like Yeah, I feel like I don't want to get away from the Dolphins too much because we've been doing that a lot, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like it's Dallas fun. is so, like, I don't want to say mediocre, but just so just forgettable at this point that, like, there's really no reason to hate their fans. They're not out here saying it's our year every year anymore. They're just yeah. kind of there, and then something goofy happens in the playoffs, and that, that, that ends up being the end of it. Like the, the damn quarterback draw, which is still one of the greatest play calls in NFL history. I mean, I, I think that play kind of stuck the cockiness out of Cowboys fans. And yeah. like la- last year, last year they were a little fiery. Like I'll admit it, but this off season, I haven't seen any Cowboys fans causing problems. In, it's because the Cowboys got worse. Stuff. Oh they, yes, they, they did, got humbled. They most definitely did. They got, they humbled. got humbled. Yeah, that is very much true. And then you have Steelers fans, which I made uh, my Steelers prediction on TikTok the other day. You know, I've been doing like the little, oh, ex- no. yeah. And I said Pittsburgh's defense, I thought could be like a top thirteen to fifteen unit, maybe a little bit higher. And the amount of people that came at me and said, "This is a top three unit in football. You're out of your mind. You should have your TikTok deleted immediately." Oh, like, God. like what? From last year where they were like 20th we overall, worst against the defense. run. and like They were number 32. Against the in, run. In rushing Dead last. yards allowed. Dead last. They were below average against the pass, and they were like ranked in the high 20s or the low 20s overall. But because they got Tyson Alualu back and they added Miles Jack, they go from 22nd or whatever to top two. Oh my gosh. You got a Kella Witherspoon at cornerback one, by the way. Thank you. That was my biggest gripe with their defense. They don't have a number one corner. They don't. They they don't have any like anyone close to being a stud outside of Akello. Akello is good, but like But Akello's more of a nickel guy anyways. Yeah. He's, he's not like, really the best outside corner. And then I don't know. I I think that's just like a Mike Tomlin has that dog in him type of take. I don't care how much dog Mike Tomlin has in him, and he has a lot. You are not he telling me a that's lot. a top three defense. <laughs> there is no chance. <laughs> yeah. Another guy tried to tell me that they had uh, the best pass rush in football because of just TJ Watt and whoever was on the opposite side of him does not matter at all whatsoever. Yeah, Mayward, you know, that's a, that's a pretty darn good pass rush. But it I is, but I don't think it would be number one. I, I think who is number me. one? I haven't even really thought about that. I I think the Chargers potentially was, yeah. next year. Chargers yeah. potentially. You've got the the Bills. The Bills have a lot of guys now. If the Bills have like six line. guys. Yeah. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of depth there. I I hope that Liam Eikenberg eats his Wheaties the morning of the Buffalo game. Who's he gonna have That's going against him? Because it probably won't be Vaughn. Who's their other main edge? 
I mean, there's Rousseau. There's um, Basham, who they yeah. drafted in the second round. There's Ed Oliver, who's always been not like top eight pick material, but he's always been good. Yeah. Yeah. That'll. They're in such a tough division. I, I am scared for Miami because, like, they got a lot better, but Buffalo exists and the Jets got a lot better. I think they're better than the Patriots. I think the Patriots probably finished last in that division. Hey, I like what the Jets are doing. I, I think they're doing all the right stuff, but legitimately, I, I'm still not really scared of them. Like, uh, fair. You know, last, not a, that's fair. I they don't they don't quite instill fear on me. Like down the road, absolutely. I think that 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 rebuild is like an absolute masterclass. Oh mm-hmm. my gosh, they took like four of my favorite players in the entire draft in the top thirty eight. Yeah, they did not miss on a single pick, and then they no. and then they fleece the Panthers for Sam Darnold, and they kind of sort of fleece the Seahawks for Jamal Adams. It's like yeah, I am scared of that team down the road, but yeah. And I'm also we'll see you this year. I'm a massive Zach Wilson fan. He's like oh, one yeah. of my favorite Zach quarterbacks Wilson, in football. The Zach Wilson agenda thrives, man. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's gonna thrive. Yeah. I had a see, last year was the first year I started really like watching college football before the offseason. I didn't do it a whole lot, but I did a little bit. And Zach Wilson was the main guy I was watching because I thought, okay, the Bears are probably gonna be picking around 20. This guy's probably oh, going to be available around 20, and I like what I see out of him. And then out of nowhere, he just shoots all the way up, and we got Justin Fields, which obviously I'm not upset about, but I like Zach Wilson a lot. And Man, was that a debate. Fields versus Wilson mm-hmm. was a huge one. And I was a I Zach was on, Wilson guy all the way. I was on. I was actually on Team Fields just by a hair, but I thought yeah. they were both top five prospects. So. Yeah, I had, you still got a... I have, I'm, I'm not jumping off either of those hills yet, yeah. for sure. I have a lot of faith in Fields, but I was very much a anti-Fields agenda pusher until he got drafted by Chicago because I've got a kid that I know that's a big Ohio State fan, and I cannot um, stand him. So I wanted Fields to be bad, so bad. And then Chicago gets him, and I'm like, well, <sighs> all right, I thought Mac, the feeling on draft night, the elite takes vibe check, was that Mac Jones would be a bear, so... You want to know who I thought it was going to be and I had talked myself into? Kellen Lance. Mond at 20. Mond? Oh I my talked God. myself into Mond. Because I thought <laughs> I, there's no way. I had way. a slight Kellen Mond agenda. I, I did. I thought he was like the... <laughs> I thought I, he was the underrated guy of the class. Listen, I, did. I saw that clip of him throwing a football and it hit the top of the workout facility. And I was like, that's my quarterback. I am sold. That's my quarterback. Man, would that be a nasty agenda to push if they had actually done that. <laughs> oh, my God. We would be in shambles. Nagy would probably still have a job because nobody would want the Bears job if Fields wasn't there. It, that would have been blamed on Ryan Pace. Like, 100%. Pace would be gone. Nagy would still have a job, though. And that would be horrifying. Um, But getting back to the Dolphins, because that's what we're supposed to be talking about here. Um, So their secondary, obviously, we just went over. Fantastic. Best unit on the team. Really good. I I think it's, I think it stacks up with like the Saints, Ravens, Bills, and Packers. Like, I I think Mm -hmm. those are the top five. And quite honestly, I could see the Dolphins as high as number three on that list. I can get behind that. I can get behind that. So the linebacking core, and I will just include the edge rushers here as well. I'm admittedly not sure how to feel about this group. And maybe it's, that's... It's, it's pretty mid. Like, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> um, like Jerome Baker, he, he's like slightly above average. Yeah. Like, I remember I was looking into linebackers and... It really is the most mid position talent wise in the NFL. Like there are f- like seven guys where you're like, these guys are really good. And then there's and then everyone else, else yep. like in the same tier. And like yep. Jerome Baker is is in like that top twenty to you know, borderline top ten linebacker um tier. So so he's good, but besides that, Alandon Roberts is is pretty old. Um 
But we did go out um, and draft Tyndall. What's his name? Channing Tyndall. Yes, Tyndall. Tyndall. I, I'm really such was a, a fan cool of the name. Tyndall pick. Such a cool name. Just as a it's side a, note, it is a cool name. It's a dope name. I, I think Tyndall. If if it were my decision, I would start Tyndall because like he coming out of the draft, he was kind of known as one of like the more high IQ NFL ready linebackers. So mm-hmm. I, I think like. I would start him over Roberts, but that's probably not what's going to be happening. Yeah. I think he's going to be like the guy we bring in for QB spy packages. Um, so the linebacking core is, I would say, definitely like in terms of the off ball guys, definitely the weakest point of our defense. Yeah. I mean, I would say with Tyndall, you're probably right. He's not going to get a ton of PT early on, but if he does literally anything to impress, I don't think it'll take long for him to work into a starting job. Oh, yeah. Like if I think. He does not have to do much to overtake Roberts, really? I wouldn't imagine. Roberts is... Roberts made one good play in the Raiders game, and then he was just way too slow to cover anyone, so... Valid. So then looking at the edge rushers, we've got uh, Wilkins, we've got... Wait, am I reading that right? No, I'm not. Wilkins is, Wilkins is in the interior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was reading it wrong. It's Ogba, good, Phillips, Wilkins, or not, I just did it again. I am blind. <laughs> Ogba, Phillips, Van Ginkle, Ingram, uh, Good, who's the oh, yeah, what, seventh round pick. Oh, yeah, you got the the Cameron Cameron from California, so Cameron Good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, I, I really like the Melvin Ingram signing. Like, mm-hmm. Chiefs fans... They rave about that guy and how they stole him from the Steelers midseason, and he was their only formidable edge rusher, quite frankly. Like that game against, um, made against or game that play he made against Denver was insane. Oh my God. He still got a little bit of dog left in him. He, he's he's a guy that I'm not. I would assume we are not starting, but he's definitely going to get like probably like 30, 40 percent of mm-hmm. the defensive snaps. Um, Phillips, Phillips is. He's my guy. Like, I loved him coming out of the draft. He was like that guy where if he didn't have health concerns, I would legitimately have called him a top 10 prospect. And we got him at pick 19. He, you know, he was a little bit of a sack merchant in his rookie year, like a lot of coverage sacks. And it was like, oh, he broke the Dolphins rookie sack record. That must mean he's a future superstar. But like, in in all seriousness, I, I think Phillips is definitely going to be a star um one of our guys for for many many years I, I think he is he has a he has a nice bag like of moves he's not mm-hmm. he's not like a bull rush merchant <laughs> he's not a get off merchant he really is a well-rounded edge rusher um, so i'm definitely optimistic about him yeah i mean the nfl is kind of trending towards uh really relying on rotational situations for their edge rushers and defensive linemen. So like you said, Melvin Ingram probably won't start, but having a guy like that, that's like your third, fourth edge rusher that can sub in for 30, 40% of snaps. That's always great to have their edge group. Um, I I like what they're working with. Oh yeah. It's good. You know, um, he, he really is one of the more, I would say underrated edge rushers in the league. So him, Ogba, Ingram, you know, Van Ginkles, you know, he's more of just a, replacement level guy but i i like the three we're working with i yeah. i do for sure i think phillips has potential to um eventually become like a top 15 edge rusher i think he, he's the one guy in that group that i could say having like the rashawn gary arc the rashawn gary arc god i hate that he's so good he i hate really it. good <laughs> i hate it i uh speaking of rashawn gary i was there was some graphic that got tweeted and it was like the best front sevens in football and they had Pittsburgh as number one, which is hysterical. Um, and oh, and I listed like eight teams that I thought were better and one of them oh, was Green man. Bay and one of my buddies who's a Steelers fan he didn't reply to the tweet he messaged me personally and he said what the hell does Green Bay have that Pittsburgh doesn't and I said uh or what does Green Bay have now that Zadarius Smith is gone. And I brought up Rashawn Gary, and he and he went on this whole rant about how Rashawn Gary's a bum and not as good as T.J. Watt, and which he's not as good oh, as T.J. Watt, but he's like he's, a top oh, five I, to ten edge rusher in football. And not only that, you've got Preston Smith on the other side, who I would say is better than High Smith, and 
they drafted uh, what's his name, Inog Bear, who seems to be all right. Um, they drafted the the other guy from the Jordan Davis. Um, yeah, the um, defensive tackle group. Why am I blanking out on names tonight? I sound like such a casual. I listen, I do. Devontae White. Devontae White. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, as soon as I turn on this camera, every name leaves my brain. We were on here one time talking about uh, the Giants front office. And I think I said Bill O'Brien was their GM. Or someone like that. It was just not the right guy. And it took me like five minutes and finally I circled back and I was like, that is not the GM of the Giants. It's actually Dave Gettleman. And it was a whole thing. Um, oh, man. Also, just as a side note real quick, I'm looking at the depth chart right now. There is a safety on the Miami Dolphins named Trill Williams. Why is this not well, being talked yes, about more? Yes, Trill Williams. Um, he, w- he was good in the preseason, if I remember. He, Such a he was cool undrafted, name. and he, he made it through year one, so good for him. Such a cool name. I'm a sucker for a cool really name. Really cool name. I'm, I'm such he a sucker for a cool name. Him. He does just he's for like, being named he's Trill. On TikTok, he's always posting like these really? big hits in the practice film. Yeah, I gotta find his TikTok and follow him now. He sounds like an absolute legend. <laughs> oh yeah, he he's got some good stuff. He's not like actually big on TikTok, but he posts some he posts some nice plays in practice every now and then. Solid. All right, and then we've got this uh, defensive line consisting of, it looks like Raekwon Davis, Christian Wilkins, and is it Cedar? Sealer? Sealer. That's how you say it. He is. Man, Sealer was so good last year. Like, he did not get talked about at all, but he was such a good run Never heard of the guy. Admittedly, I've never heard of him. You you need to learn the name because I really think this guy does not – get talked about the way he deserves. I think I think he was on a tier with Wilkins in terms of the way he played last season. Interesting. He, okay. He really rose to the occasion during um our late season surge. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely have to look into him because like I said, I'd never heard of him. Um, John so, yeah, Jenkins like, is on the Dolphins. When did that happen? Yes so yeah I think um you know Wilkins and Sealer is like pretty pretty good both, I would say, top 20 defensive tackles. Uh, Raquan Davis is kind of like the, the – he was Flores' guy out of Alabama. Mm-hmm. Um, so that there's kind of that mystery element there where he he's huge. Like, he is ginormous. He's one of those guys that comes in every now and then and shows these ridiculous flashes. He's 6'7"? Jesus. Yeah, I he, did not know he was giant. that tall. I knew so, he was big. I knew he was 300 plus, but I didn't know he was 6'7". That's nuts. And that's the part that upsets me because he was like Brian Flores' little secret project that was slowly putting it all together, and you hope he can keep up that trajectory. Future Pittsburgh Steeler. <laughs> Future Pittsburgh Steeler. Unfortunately. That's the only way he can finish his arc. He has to go to Pittsburgh and oh, reunite no. with Flores. Speaking that, of that is just an unfortunate dynamic that Flores had to go to the Steelers. I was, yeah. I was just because gonna now that, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you go ahead. I was just gonna say we need to talk about Flores because I did not think about that until just yeah, now. Yeah, we have he's definitely like man, tough loss. I'm not gonna lie. He he had no idea um how to manage his offensive coaching staff, but that defense was just like our emotion every single week. It it was a it was a joy to watch. Truly, it really was. Yeah, and you don't just luck into seven straight. Or it wasn't was it seven straight or was it more than seven straight? At the end of the it year was, last it year, it was seven. I think okay. it was. You don't just luck into that. He's clearly oh, a no. great coach, and for he him is. to have to go under such unfortunate circumstances over such stupid, stupid issues with that team is unforgivable and it sucks that he is resigned to being like a a glorified position coach in pittsburgh because he's so much more than that he's capable of so much more he is but i mean he's really you know that's that's a bet on himself move and and i bet you that he does become their defensive coordinator and i bet that he does get a job as a head coach within the next 
five five or so years. That, that's that's a pretty obvious um, prediction, but yeah, um, man, I don't like, know. Like, I'm a little concerned with him getting a job, though, given the fact that he was suing the league. Because I don't know. That is true. I don't know that how owners are going to be looking at him and and considering he was suing owners for treating him poorly. See, that's my thing. Is I was like, how is he going to get hired by the employer that he's actively suing right. but if if that eventually dies down over the years i i could definitely um see someone taking a chance yeah. on him like a, a bottom feeder with no with no grit on defense like he he's totally that guy he he is totally the guy that could walk in and transform a defense with no dog mm. in them listen and it's like he would have been the perfect head coach for Chicago if he wouldn't have been in that situation. That fits Chicago so well. A defense that doesn't have any dog in them. That's exactly what they had last year. Yeah, and the, and the thing with the Dolphins' win streak is everyone was like, oh, Mickey Mouse just feasting on a bunch of bad teams. And I think that is kind of the problem with how fans perceive the NFL today. It was a defensive masterclass. Like, mm-hmm. the offense was not good. But for some reason, that made everyone think that we were just squeaking by everyone. No, we were, like, shutting out every quarterback we faced. We gave Lamar Jackson his worst just, game in yep. years. We we quite frankly bailed Tua out in the Saints game. Um, he, he did not come to play, but we only allowed, I think, three points in that game. I mean, it it was phenomenal. Like, the defense in those seven weeks was just... It was phenomenal. It, I will never be able to witness that level of defensive prowess, I think, in the rest of my lifetime, what they did in those seven weeks. I, I yeah. think they didn't allow 20 points more than once. I don't think a single time a team reached 20 on us. Mm-hmm. See, I absolutely agree with, with the whole Mickey Mouse claim. NFL fans don't know how to act when there's not 50 combined points minimum put up in a game anymore. They don't understand the value of defense and how much fun a defensive masterclass can be. Like watching that Baltimore game is some of the most fun I've had watching football oh in forever. God. It was beautiful. It, it, it was it was phenomenal. It, it was like it was insane. the crowd was into it. Xavier and Howard returned to fumble fifty yards. Lamar Jackson looked flabbergasted. Like it was just like what more mm-hmm. could I have asked for in a game where we really had no business winning? Right. If it wasn't for Brian Flores dialing up the cover zero spamming it it, it worked to a cover charm, zero. Man. it really did yeah now you're he how, loved the cover zero mm-hmm. now you're 16 right yes okay when did you get into football do you remember like what year that would have been i mean I, i've always watched football like on a casual level in terms of like you know serious um, it, it was really two years ago okay. where I became like a serious football fan that really paid attention to every team, not just the Dolphins. Okay. So before that, when it was just the Dolphins, how long do you think that was? It was like 2013 to, uh, through the tank for two a season. Okay. So I guess my point doesn't really work then. Cause you started watching football two years after me. I was going to say, I don't know if you remember like back when football for lack of better words, felt like football when we weren't in this era where it was 30 points a game is the norm and running the ball feels irrelevant. And obviously fullbacks have kind of fallen out of relevancy. I miss that. Uh, Not, not just because of the fullbacks, but like as a whole, I miss that era of football. It really used to be. Because it was more competitive. It was, it was a grinded out mentality. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think like the Washington teams in like the early to mid 2010s were like the epitome of that where um you had Kirk Cousins um mid off every single week with him <laughs> the offense was horrible but somehow they grinded their way to like a 9 and 7 playoff spot because their defense was incredible um we don't appreciate those teams enough these days just yeah. because Aaron Rodgers dotted them up in the wild card we don't appreciate teams like that anymore yeah nfl fans don't care about defense at, at all I stand on that belief firmly. Like we were just doing the Texans episode and the one guy I was talking to on there tried to convince me the defense doesn't win championships. He tried to say that that wasn't a valid claim anymore. I think that, I think the 2015 Broncos 
gave me all the faith I needed in that claim that defense wins championships. The 2022 Rams give you all the faith you need in that because their yeah. offense was great. It got them there, but once you got to the Super Bowl, the defense won them the game. The Buccaneers the four, year before that, the defense five. won them the game. Yeah, exactly. Did Cooper Cup win you the game, or did Aaron Donald win you the game? Exactly. That's the debate to be exactly. had. Exactly. It's and then I don't well, know, like how, equally important. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you feel about the new overtime rules, but I think that was a terrible decision. I, I like the old overtime rules. I mean, I'm I'm a sucker for extra football, so fair enough. The, I we're we're gonna have to disagree on that one. I, yeah. I think it was a nice move. I mean, if you want to look at it from extra football standpoint, sure. But the way I look at it, it devalues the importance of defense in overtime to a certain extent. Like, yeah, you still got to get a stop to a certain extent, but you're not life or death trying to get it. Like we saw the Bengals this past year in the AFC Championship game get that big stop they needed against arguably the most talented quarterback ever and then go on to win the game. And I think that's just how football games should be won. And I, I'm an old head. I'm a 19-year-old old head. I, I I don't know if that's apparent <laughs> or not. You're like, uh, <laughs> you're more into defense than my dad, quite frankly. <laughs> I mean, the first... That's funny. The first year I got into football was like 2011, and that unfortunately was the end of like the Erlacher, Lovey Smith, Tampa 2 era. But... God, going back and watching the highlights from that era, Erlacher and Briggs and Tillman and Jennings, and uh, it's that's football. That is football that is, right there. I will take that over Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen dueling it out in the playoffs any day of the week. Call me crazy. I mean, the 2018 Bears were a really fun team. Yeah. And that, that was all they did. It was, was all defense. Exactly. It wasn't even really was grinding real. out wins. It was just Chicago's defense overpowered everything and forced to turn over every other possession. And I mean, Eddie Jackson brought that somewhat offensive element where he was an offensive player once he got the ball yeah. in his hand. But like he went from an offense, it was a really cool he went from an offensive player on defense to an offensive player on defense because he is god awful. I hate that man. There is not a he sim- went from Defensive player of the year to offensive player. Literally, of the year. he has not forced a turnover in like three years. It, it's insanity. It's really sad. He yeah. was one of my favorite players back at Alabama. 2018 Eddie Jackson was one of the most fun football players I have ever watched. That pick six he had against the Lions on Thanksgiving, where he read the flat route, completely yeah. jumped it, and took it to the house. That was beautiful. But he couldn't do that again. I don't know what happened to him, but he can't do it. It's a, it's. It's, I don't know. It's a shame. I could go on a whole 30-minute rant about Eddie Jackson and how much I hate him and how bad he is. It's It looks to me like a lack of effort thing, but it, we're supposed to be talking about the Dolphins. <laughs> At the very least, he's not Allen Robinson. He's true. around. I he would rather him leave. I would rather <laughs> demand a trade. Get out. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. B- bye. I, oh, I would trade Eddie Jackson for a fourth-round pick right now. That's what we spent on him. I'll take my return really on investment. Think you can get a fourth round no, pick ready, Jack. No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Might get a sixth if we're lucky. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And NFL <sighs> fans will tell you huge pickup. Huge pickup. Mm-hmm. NFL fans will tell you he's good because his Madden rating is above 85. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah. Madden and fantasy football have ruined how football fans enjoy the sport, unfortunately, and how they evaluate players. The the Madden thing, especially, I think, is like it's why I think a lot of people aren't willing to move on from the players who are still clearly regressing, like JJ Watt, for example. Mm-hmm. Um there's another good example of that. Eddie Jackson. Tyron Matthew. Yeah. Like Tyron Matthew. He's treated, coasting like, off name value so hard right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that dude was making business move after business move last year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you get five extra yards. You get five extra yards. You get yeah. five extra yards. But I'm just going to shrug at Daniel Sorensen to make it look like I'm the stud back there. Listen. That is the epitome of what Eddie Jackson does. Either that or he looks around like he doesn't know what's going on. Like that touchdown to Justin Jefferson where he stood there and the ball flew oh over his gosh. head. The easiest touchdown of your life. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> or uh, week that. one when he didn't touch Cooper Cup down. He landed and Eddie Jackson just stared at him and oh, he got up and ran for a touchdown. <sighs> that was a fun 
That week one game was actually fun for like the first 15 minutes. Justin Fields had a rushing and touchdown and everything. They the David Montgomery, Montgomery run got me fired up. I was like, oh, wow. I love this guy's like David Montgomery. I love that man, but he's underrated. not gonna, But he's not going to be there next year, unfortunately. I hate that. Is that, it Khalil Herbert season? It's going to be David Montgomery's season, but like – the wide zone offense we're running, Herbert fits a little bit better because he's got a little bit more pep in his step and he can hit that edge quicker. Oh, yeah. And um, he's younger. He's cheaper. You don't have to pay him. So really I, wanted, I want it to be David Montgomery season forever. I get so attached to our running backs. I really do. Matt Forte was oh, one of my I favorite players backs. growing up. Running, mm-hmm. running backs, like fantasy football side, they really are a, a phenomenal position. Mm-hmm. Just fo- really fun to watch. Yeah. And as a Bears fan, that's usually like the one consistent offensive player we have is either a running back or some random one. Jordan lineman. Howard. Dolphins Jordan and Howard, Bears legend. Yep. 16 Jordan Howard. One of the most overrated seasons yeah, ever, by the way. For the Dolphins. He's not a good, he was never a good running back. I don't care what anyone says. He was getting like 40 touches a game. That's why he had so many yards. That's the only reason why he had any production was because of that. He was not good. But, um, but hey, Pro Bowler, most oh, Pro Bowler, in football. yeah, just pro like bowler. Mitchell Trubisky, Pro Bowl quarterback. I love that meme so much. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> the picture with him and Watson and Mahomes. Don't remind me. I mean, oh, I man. guess now what? I don't really care about passing up on Watson. I would rather have a bad quarterback than a, you know. Yeah. But with Mahomes. Yeah. Which there's no guarantee he would have been good either. Nagy could have easily messed it. Well, I guess there's no guarantee Nagy comes around. I don't know. Mahomes Chicago would have found guy, a way to ruin him. He never should have been drafted that high. He's just a egotistic maniac with a baseball arm. He can't play <laughs> real football. Matt Nagy would have turned uh, Patrick Mahomes into Alex Smith. Literally. That's what he wanted every quarterback to be. That was the Nagy problem. Oh, okay. He thought every quarterback was Alex Smith, and he thought every offensive line. Why did he line... go out and trade for Alex Smith? He tried to when he got Nick Foles. That's right. He did. Traded now, a fourth... now I'm kind of remembering that. Traded for a fourth-round pick to get – or traded a fourth-round pick for Nick Foles and then signed Andy Dalton the next offseason. He tried to get Alex Smith twice and never did. Man, he is tried that, his hardest. that's Matt Nagy in a, bu- in a mm-hmm. nutshell. Yeah, I I got in an argument with a Chargers fan of all people one time who was defending Nagy. He he was trying to push this pro Nagy agenda like he's actually not that bad. Bears fans are just stupid and can't understand football. And I was like, "Listen, if you're not a pocket passer quarterback that has zero mobility and can stay calm when there's literally six people coming at you from all angles because your offensive line is atrocious, you are not going to function in a Matt Nagy offense. I mean, that one clip that you posted of Alex Bars trying to block uh, Nick Bosa, that is Matt Nagy's offense summed up. That is Matt Nagy's you offense back. guarantee. You should go back and watch my videos. I would react to the Bears games when they got put on Monday Night Football last year. <sighs> I remember I went on this whole rant, you know, the Vikings fourth and like two incident where Fields just ran right into like five guys. Um, but really the moment I realized I matured and <laughs> realized that Matt Nagy was not that guy was um, in the back end of 2020 when Bill Lazor was like so clearly better at calling plays than yes. him. Yes. And literally That's all all Bill Lazor did, he went to Mitch and said, hey, Bootleg. What? Bootleg. Yeah. What do you think will help you? And Mitch said, get me outside of the pocket. And he said, say less. And that was the whole offense. Just run Mitch to the right side. Let him throw two yard drags the whole way down the field. And it worked. And it let worked. David Montgomery feast. Let David Montgomery cook. And also let Cole Komet carry like six people on him in the Texans game. <laughs> Have you ever seen oh, that? Man. Have you ever seen when he was carrying like three dudes on oh, him? Oh, yeah. It's I the- was what? See, like. I, I'm in Texas, so mm-hmm. unfortunately I get the Texans games every week. I was watching that game. Man, that this Bears offense is booming. Yeah, it's like, where did all, this come from? And all it took was a couple bootlegs. One of the most <laughs> simplistic offensive concepts is all it took. But no, Matt Nagy thinks every quarterback is Alex Smith. 
Therefore, you must stay in the pocket and act like you know what you're doing. Oh, man. You have to stay in the pocket, read the entire defense, and settle for your check down after you check every other read within the .2 seconds you have with the offensive line blocking. I mean, I will say the one thing that he did for Justin Fields is I went back and watched every Justin Fields passing attempt, mm -hmm. and he, he has pocket poise. That was the one thing <laughs> that he could have potentially gotten out of Nagy is that he has some – Really solid pocket for it. Yeah. Yeah. And even though he was operating behind, you know, Nick Bosa against Alex Bars. Yeah. He somehow stayed calm. I don't know how he did it. Listen, uh, jokes aside, Fields legitimately has that dog in him. He's one of the toughest dudes in all of football. Like, oh man, I just remember when he got up from that hit in the preseason, the Bills dude who like blindsided him. Took his helmet off. That was the moment I knew that Fields was not this soft darling quarterback and that happened twice that more crazy. during the season minka fitzpatrick got him and i think eric kendricks oh, yeah. was the other one and he just popped right back up and then back in college when he like broke his ribs in a bowl or was it a bowl oh, game or a man. playoff he, game i think it was a playoff it game. was the semifinal, national yeah. semifinal. he Oops. broke his ribs and just kept going he he has nails man he has nails yeah. i really hope he pans out i'm so excited for luke getsy Luke Getzey is implementing like a Shanahan-esque offense, which got the Bears their first fullback since 2018. I'm so excited for that. And just get Fields uh, um, better mechanics, get him some better weapons, and there's something there for sure. Yeah. I still believe in him. Yeah, they can. He, uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the clips of him throwing uh, at like practice it and stuff, better. but yeah, yeah, it looks way better. He doesn't do that dip oh, anymore, where he brings it like all no. the way back. It's it's, it's not existent now. And, like, look what that did for Josh Allen. I'm not saying Fields is going to be Josh Allen, but, you know. Every mediocre top ten pick turns into Josh Allen year three. Remember that. Remember that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and That's I, why Tua is winning MVP. <laughs> Tua MVP. I want to start pushing a random MVP narrative, and I think Derek Carr is going to be my guy. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, hey. I... I I'm doing one of those series. I'm, I'll actually tell you what I have planned because this will go up way after. I'm doing – it's like the, the hot takes to get progressively hotter. I want to run oh, these by yeah. you real quick. I want to see what you – so my 10% was just that Mahomes and Rodgers are the two best quarterbacks in football. I feel like that's pretty well accepted. Second one, the terms overrated and underrated are insanely overused and have basically lost all meaning because NFL fans don't understand them. Uh, the third one, Justin Jefferson, consensus wide receiver one after next year. I love that one. My next one, it was... That is my agenda right now, I, is that Justin I, Jefferson I agree. this year's Cooper Cup. I agree. I agree 100%. Yeah. The only thing that would hold him back is Kirk Cousins. Legitimately. That's the only thing he has going against him. And even then, Kirk if is Kirk all right Cousins, enough to, to allow him to do his thing. Hey, all we need, all we need is for Kirk Cousins to be Jared Goff this year. That's all we need. <laughs> yeah. Because that is... He is literally like... That is the role that Coop, that you need to have Justin Jefferson putting up Cooper Cup production. Yeah. It's just please for the for everything, Kirk Cousins. Please just be like Jared Goff this year. <laughs> I feel like that isn't asking too much. Yeah, my uh, my forty percent was that the Saints are contenders because I feel like not a lot of people are talking mm -hmm. about the Saints. I like what they've got going. I'm a big Winston fan. I think Winston can be I that guy. Yeah, the Saints are um, the Saints are a team that I, I'm still honestly trying to figure out. I, I'm I don't want to really talk about them until we see what's going on with Michael Thomas and and also Jameis. Like fair, those are two big question marks. But yeah. I, I definitely see the vision where at their best. Okay, I definitely okay. So my fifty percent, I have JT and Chubb are better than Derrick Henry currently. I feel like. I don't know. I, that's, that's a Coco either way. Yeah, I either just way. I just like that they're capable of more. Like Henry's probably the, the – I would say he's the more dominant player. But Chubb and Taylor give you more out of the backfield. Like Henry's not catching passes. He's not – he doesn't have the speed. He doesn't have anything like that. But, I mean, JT and Chubb can do everything out of the backfield. They're incredible. I, I think that they, they will both surpass him this year, but – for, for now, I'm giving Henry the benefit of the doubt. Fair. That, that's just me for now. Fair. 60% uh, I have that the old overtime rules are fine, which we already 
talked about. Oh, it's going to get people going. Oh, listen, sure. it's not even the first time I've pushed this agenda on my TikTok, and it's always fun to read the comments. Um, 70% I have that Mahomes is the most talented quarterback of all time, and I firmly believe this. That I can get behind it. It's him and Rodgers. Yeah. 80% I have that Fields, Lawrence, Wilson, and Lance will all end up being top 15 quarterbacks within the next two years. That that one is, yeah, I mean, like, I think one of them is bound to underwhelm, but. I know, don't think so. It, it, I don't I think, think so. That QB class is most certainly special. So I think if genuinely speaking, I think it'll go down as one of, if not the best quarterback class ever. If all four of those guys can pan out, I, I, I don't see any reason it wouldn't be. Maybe I'm forgetting one year where like six Hall of Famers were taken or something. <laughs> I know 83 was insane. Uh, that was like the Elway year. Um, 90%. This is literally a take that I got from you that Kyler's better than Lamar. And I, I'm fully on oh, the bandwagon. Man. You convinced me. You 100% convinced me. I haven't I'm, been able to convince many people, but I, I'm glad you see the vision there. I absolutely see the vision. And then 100, I had to go with one that's on brand. I have that Kyle Juszczyk is a top five most impactful non-quarterback oh. in football. Just call him a top five player in the NFL. Just do it. You know I, you do, I do want to. I really do. And I don't do think that's that Die big of a hill. stretch. I don't even You're, think that's that big of a stretch. That should be your 100% take. And I don't even think it's that big of a stretch. Like, everything... I mean, I think the impact is damn near, like, should be consensus, given everything he adds to the 49ers offense and what they would be without him. But, like, how many other players are able to do everything he does at the level he does consistently over the course of, what, like a decade now? Cooper Cup, the only fullback ever. <laughs> <laughs> to do that i had a i had theo on the packers podcast and he called he brought oh, up yeah. Cooper cup being a fullback <laughs> but yep. he, he's on the fullback wave though theo is a fullback believer he, he said a fullback he storm is. is brewing and i love that's been like everyone i've talked to like everyone that i've had on here that i like have a lot of respect for and i wanted to hear their opinion on they've all been fans of it like, I had Brett Coleman on the Texans episode. He was a fullback truther. Oh, my gosh. You got him? Yes. That's awesome. I know. That is awesome. Dude, like, I don't think I've ever had to try to not fanboy harder in my entire life. Because that man is, like, my idol with this content creation thing. He I, is so I love awesome, Brett man. Coleman. I love him. Mm -hmm. And he's the one, legitimately speaking, he's the one that put me onto the Shanahan offense. He made a video about it, and I watched it, and I was like, I see the vision. I understand. This is art. This is perfection. He is. He really is like the the very best film guy in the football community. Mm -hmm. He is the ultimate ball knower. Yep. So, um, with my okay, I got one more question for you with Miami because that's what we're supposed to be talking about. That's like the fourth <laughs> time I've said we that. We really drifted off. Listen, it's fine. It happens. That's the beauty yeah. of football. You come in with one it topic happens. and then it spreads. You sh I don't know. Did you watch the, the Ravens episode I did with the Next Network? I, I didn't have a chance okay. to, but I, I definitely want to. Yeah, there was a point where I asked Michael about the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he went on a 10 minute rant about the geography of the city of Pittsburgh and how oh it's a place God. he wants to visit. So <laughs> us getting, at least we're staying within the confines of football here. At least we're talking ball. Yeah. Like, at the very least. Mm -hmm. So obviously as a Dolphins fan, uh, Devonte Parker has been a guy that's been with your team for probably the majority of the time you've been watching football, right? Yep. How does it feel knowing that you not only traded him, but traded him to a division rival and the team that, for lack of better words, has owned your franchise for pretty much your entire life. I mean, it was a move that it, it had to be done. Like, mm -hmm. I think that a fourth round pick is what I was hoping for. If that was the best offer, guess we have to suck it up. He, he's, he's good. Like, he is one of the best contested catchers in the NFL. But I, I am willing to bet he does not play more than nine games this year for them he he Fair. is made of glass unfortunately but i will always have a soft spot in my heart for how he went nuclear in the tank for two a season 
Um, wish we had gotten that product of him before, but you know, it's it's another average, like pretty average receiver going to a pretty average skill room. So it, it's not the end of the world. But yeah, I will miss him. I will root for him anytime he is not facing the men in turquoise. The men in turquoise. I've never heard that before. <laughs> I just made that up on the spot. But Look at hey. this man go. The men in turquoise. That sounds so non-threatening. That is so... I mean, the Dolphins are not an intimidating mascot in the first place. No, but... Like, Everyone his, just loves our jersey, so yeah, we get a pass. But, like, historically, they're a threatening franchise. I mean, you think of the Dolphins. Larry Zonka's the first player that comes to mind, and he's one of, like, the meanest dudes ever. I mean, yeah, only undefeated team yeah. ever, so... Mm-hmm. We'll always have that. Yeah. We came close. We were one game off. Although that team was better. The 85 Bears were a better team. They were. They okay. were. I got him to admit it. All right. All right. I got, I got one other question, actually. Um, just because I've got a friend that's a big Teddy Bridgewater fan. And he has this idea that Tua, if he falls apart, Teddy Bridgewater is going to lead Miami to the promised land. Do you think there's a chance that happens? It, it, I'd be lying to you if it hadn't crossed my mind, the thought of <laughs> Teddy Bridgewater taking the field, right? Because <laughs> I had to consider it. Because I'm, I kind of like Teddy. I do too. I, I think he did a good I think he did a good job in Carolina. Mm-hmm. I think he did a fine job in Denver. I just I think that he didn't really have the coaching staff in Denver, offensively at least. I, it wouldn't be the end of the world if, if he took the field, really and truly. Like, that is a guy that is not going to single-handedly lose you a game. So would he lead us to more than a wild card win? No, but he is the safety blanket if Tua, you know, were to get the Jesse Davis treatment again and get blasted by AJ Epinesa off the edge. So it, it has crossed my mind. I will admit it. Fair enough. So what do you think their record will be? Where do you see them finishing? To be honest, um, I, I think it's eight to ten wins. Like, okay. we are a playoff caliber team, um, but unfortunately, no matter what what I do to convince myself, I I can't convince myself we're a top seven team in the AFC right now. It, it's an unfortunate year, um, but I, I think there there's still an outside chance. We have the upside, I would say, to sneak in as the seven or six seed, um, but. If we can just get through like those first five games of the season, come out like two and three rather than like one and four, which would just be a death sentence. Um, but if we can make it out of that Patriots, Ravens, um, I believe, Bengals, and then we got the. Yeah, those first five games. Dear God, um, you've second. got two of running the gauntlet right off the bat. That's not good. I mean, we're. We're putting them. We're gonna see. We're gonna see pretty quickly here. <laughs> You're gonna. Oh, it's Patriots, Dolphins, Bills. Um, then we got the Bengals and the Jets. So if we can get out of there two and three, um, I think we're on the trajectory to, um, compete for a wild card spot. Did you just say Patriots, Dolphins, Bills, Bengals, Jets? It, Patriots, Ravens. Bills. Okay, I was gonna say they really got y'all playing yourselves. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Plot twist, though, Brian Flores is coaching the alternate (laughs) Dolphins team. Brian Flores is coaching the second team, led by uh, Raekwon Davis and Teddy Bridgewater. It's his revenge. It's his revenge tour. Oh, my gosh. Raekwon Davis and Teddy Bridgewater. I don't... Wreaking havoc. Part of me thinks Flores might be able to pull it off. Shaheen the Machine, mossing everyone. (laughs) Yeah, Javon Holland is no match for Adam Shaheen. Nope. Absolutely nope. not. <clears throat> He's going to get owned, I'm afraid. Yep. He's going to be uh, what we thought he was out of Ashland University. True baby Gronk. Oh, Ashland legend. <laughs> Ashland Adam legend, Adam Shaheen. Well, I think that's a good note to end it on, unless you have anything else you want to add, any players you want to bring up that didn't get mentioned, or literally anything. I think I think we had a great talk, man. Absolutely. It was awesome. Absolutely. Um. I mean, you can feel free to plug your stuff. Not that you really need a boost from my end, <laughs> but if, if mean, you want to. Just 
Just follow me on TikTok, Elite Takes. It's it's one whole. It's just all lowercase. Elite Takes. And the name definitely matches the content. Nico, thank you so much for coming on. Like you said, it was a fantastic talk. We went for way longer than I expected us to. But it's okay because there was a lot of great football talk, a great discussion, all that kind definitely. of stuff. Uh, we'll yeah, thank you for having me on. <clears throat> Absolutely. We'll have to have you back on again. Um, I'm down. I'm down. Also, do sh it. shout out Travis who left like 20 minutes in. I just checked it, it was, Twitter and he said he had to go and I just didn't see it. So it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, it, it was. And I, I have one way I want to end off this episode. Oh no. Okay. We're going to finish what we started. Broncos country. <laughs> Let's ride.